All right, so coach, yeah, I mean, you're there, you got it behind you. Um, yeah. Maybe some magic camera work, but let's yeah. start here, right? Kansas Jayhawks, a level of one to you forgot your passport and you're at the airport and the flight boards in an hour <laughs> of panic level. Where are the Jayhawks at? Uh, they're probably at a five, you know, five or six, because uh, three losses in a row is almost unheard of at KU. It really is. Uh, and it's a credit to Bill Self and the history and the program, the tradition, the players, um, that they don't ever get into this situation very often. But they find themselves not only in this situation right now, but think about the next few. They go to Kentucky. They got K-State at home. Then they go to Iowa State. And I'm sure it doesn't get easier from there. I know they got TCU on the road later on. And let me put it in a 30,000-foot perspective for you. Normally, when I was coaching, I'd look at the schedule and I'd say, oh, my God, late January is a gauntlet, those five games. The problem in this league this year is from December 31st to March 4th, the entire league's a gauntlet. So it's not going to get easier for Kansas. There's definitely a panic level, I got to think. And uh, Bill Self finds himself in a unique situation that he hasn't been in very often in 20 years. Yeah, you talk about that gauntlet. I saw something today. The predicted winner is expected to have seven losses in the Big 12. And I yeah. still think that that's like an achievement. I think if you only had seven losses in this league, it'd be like, bravo. You know, you wonder how they're going to do that with the seating. But, yeah. man, it's a gauntlet. Well, here's what here, – here it's a great point. Let me give you some perspective here. Texas Tech and West Virginia are 1-13, and, and yet three weeks ago they were both ranked. Yeah. I mean, where would they finish in the Big East? You know, yeah, well, they, both of them, both of them will probably be in the middle of the pack or mi upper middle for sure. Um, but that I don't think they'd be at the bottom of the league. Oh. That's for sure. The other thing about this league is they put a lot of they, they say, you know, save for a rainy day. Their non-conference record and power ranking, if you look at Ken Palm, was so strong that it's miles from number two. It's probably Big Ten, you know, number three, SEC. So hopefully the committee, when they do the analytics first, they'll see that this league is le legitimately as strong as we said it was. Uh, you know what I mean? Like before the year, we all we all said, well, the Big 12 is probably the best league. And the interesting thing, Rico, is it's not NBA guys that are doing it. Oh. It's not one and done guys. This league, I've been around this league for a long time. It's Buddy Heald. It's Desmond Bain. It's Javon Carter. It's Frank Mason. Devontae Graham. And now with the transfer portal, eligibility right away, COVID stuff, getting the fifth year, this league's a monster because from one to 10, they're literally, you know, proved outside the league there was no weak team. No, there's not. And, you know, touching on Kansas, right? So the worry, I'm actually doing a Kansas podcast in a little bit. Yeah. The worry is no true center. You know, you got KJ Adams, who's six seven. Is that what's really been plaguing them because you can also look, they got really good guards. They got big yeah. guards. So do they make up with that? But if they yeah. don't have a true center and have a true center with size, are they doomed? Well, yes and no. I mean, they, they don't have do a doke Azubuki or David McCormick, and they certainly miss that kind of size inside, but this team was number two in the country three games ago. Yeah. You know what I mean? And the only loss outside of the league, and they always try to play a tough non-conference the only loss outside of the league was uh, Tennessee, who smacked them in, in Atlantis. But, yes, if you if you ask me, do they miss a David McCormick or size like that, they do. The two freshman bigs, obviously, according to Bills, are just not ready to help them yet, right? So, K.J. Uh, Adams has been like their Draymond Green, whatever, you, you know, that kind of guy. Um, but here's what I think happens. Dewan Harris is being exposed right now, not because he doesn't score, but because if you shut down Grady Dick, they really don't shoot the three well. Well, ha Harris was great from three. He's got five points in the last four games. Yeah, I think he's remarkable. So his struggle, yeah. that was my right. next question. What's going on with him? Well, I think he's struggling because guys he's throwing to, like, you know, Jalen Wilson is tremendous. Unbelievable. But if you notice, a lot of Jalen Wilson's baskets, and this is by design, I'm telling you. And even in the second half of last night's game, what did Grady Dick finally do? Drive the ball. And if you know Bill Self, it's always about scoring in the paint. And it used to be we scored in the paint because we had, you know, Darrell Arthur, uh, Doak Azabuki, and all the guy, you know, Cole Aldridge. Wiggins. Yeah, well, you know, guys like that that could really score around the basket. 
And But the other genius of Bill Self is when they don't have the big post player, they are driving it down the lane. They're running into you offensively with their body, and they're getting to the foul line. And right now, Jalen Wilson does it well. Um, Grady Dick did it in a, for the first time all year. He must have told him at halftime, you know, hey, mf -er, you better start driving. They're not giving you the jumper. They're yeah. taking the J away from you, so drive it. And he was great last night. In fact, he really helped his NBA stock last night because the teams have him in the first round, Grady Dick. But he he showed you some six foot seven, six foot eight version of Christian Brown last night. Yeah, and he's a much better shooter than Christian was. Trust me. And this he was kid, legit. Yeah, yeah. This kid in the NBA is going to be like a, a Luke Kennard type. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but anyway, so here's the, here's the deal with the. Uh, DeWan's throwing at the guys who can't make threes. Kevin McCullough can't make a three. Jalen's inconsistent, at least from the perimeter. And so his effectiveness of getting into the lane and making plays, passing it, has been, is being neutralized. And I don't care how well he shot from three for about five games. I'm telling you, if you grow, if you grow up like me on the playground of Brooklyn and all I ever do is dime guys and find, you know, hey, let's play with Fran because he's always passing it. Yeah. Sooner or later, someone's going to make me score, and that's that's not my game, and that's not Dewan Harris's game. Yeah, I mean it was. By the working. way, I was a pretty, yeah. I was a pretty good player in Manhattan Beach. Yeah, for sure. No, yeah. I, I'm getting back into it. You know what's crazy? I got to go buy basketball sneakers after all my years hooked up with the Nikes, and then working as a grad assistant. I yeah. my sneakers have two, literally 2010 on them on the Nike on the side. Well, you don't know the them. days we you don't know the days we had the Chuck Taylors, and we used to put cardboard. Yeah, you know, in the heel because yeah. they were wearing out. You know, there was some, uh, there was some sneakers. My dad made us buy those for the summer. I don't yeah. know how anybody ever wore those without the ankle support. We we never sprained our ankles. I know it's crazy, right? Now we they're never, like, we, yeah, it's we never sprained our ankles. Anyway, another that's, it, I'm, it's I'm a sneaker head. That's that's for another conversation. No, it's crazy. Yeah. Um. So across town, I yeah. talked to Jerome Tang, like unbelievable personality. Yes. He's obviously got you know Johnson and Noel rolling. What's yeah. their ceiling? What's Kansas State ceiling? Well, first of all, they got to get David Gasson back. Now, that's a name nobody knows, but he's been out for about five or six, seven games. He's a 6'10 kid, transfer from Virginia Tech, who is really a good defensive center. You know, he's back any game now. I watched them warm up when they were playing KU. Um, but I walked into their gym in October, and I know Jerome a long time, obviously, because of Baylor covering the Big 12. And I, I knew he was ready. I really did. I said it on broadcast like two, three years ago. To his credit, he waited for the right job. He didn't take the, you know, Texas San Antonio job. You right. know what I mean? He waited. Uh, and, he, and he could afford to. Um, but when I walked into the gym in October, Rico, like the vibe was uh, palpable. Like the vibe in the gym was like uh, upbeat, enthusiastic, great coaching staff. Uh, everybody was into it, you know? I just didn't know how good Keontae Johnson and Marquise Noel would be at that time. And I never heard of Naquan Tomlin until I went to, uh, right. you know, didn't play in high school, grew up like across the street from Rucker Park, uh, <laughs> Frederick Douglass Academy, didn't play high school basketball. And what they have right now legitimately is a very prepared young, he's not young anymore, but he's a very prepared first year coach. They've got two, whether they make it or not, they're both all league level first team. And then Naquan Tomlin is a second team all league level player. How the voting shakes out, I don't know. But they got three legitimate big-time Big 12 players, and um, they're for real. Now, they don't have a lot of depth, but they're for real. Yeah, Kansas doesn't have a lot of depth either, too. So Correct. They get those freshman guys ready. But So that's yeah. a perfect segue, right? So Tang's a first-year coach. I think they probably have the horses to go win it. That guy won a national title as an assistant. And like you yeah. talked about, he wasn't just a hot name for four years. He was assistant for what, 18 years at Baylor? Yeah, 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 18 or 19. Where Baylor yeah. was always in the mix. That 2012 team kind of got robbed running into Kentucky. Yeah. I thought they were talented. The COVID year, they probably got screwed. Like they got Baylor robbed. Was... They robbed. They got robbed against Duke in Houston in the Elite Eight on a fake call, a block charge that, quite frankly, was a Coach K call. You know what yeah. I mean? It, it no, was. I, I see that. No, for sure. And, and no, no offense, because I got it at Manhattan College. Like all these K, let me let me let me digress. All these KU fans say, what do you mean we get home cooking? It's it's human nature, okay? Yeah. When you're a really good team and you're playing at home and you're in the NCAA tournament and you're supposed to advance and your coach is a Hall of Famer, and, and that day that day was one bad call away from Baylor back then going to the Final Four. So, it, you know, things happen. For sure. But so he's a first-year coach. And you look around right. the nation of some of these teams 
rising up. I love Oates. Um, yep. Went down there, hung out with him. He's only been to one Sweet 16. Painter's never been to a Final Four. Hurley's never been in the second weekend. Yeah. Iowa State, Otzelberg a couple of years. Um, Tommy Lloyd's in his first, second, or third year. Texas with an interim. Dixon, no Final Fours at TCU. Am I making too big of a deal to rely on coaches with experience? Because when you look around and you're like, oh, well, let's rely on the lifers. The lifers are few and far in between. And yeah. a lot of their teams aren't remarkable. Like, bayheim has been around forever. Team's not great. Is right. also like, if, you know, at this point, if it's only first or second year guys or inexperienced guys. Yeah. Eventually, somebody's going to break through, right? Am I making too big a deal? No, no, the no. Tournament exactly experience? Right. Well, let's look at the logic. The logic is the guys that we always, the teams that have always been great, the Blue Bloods, that we've always expected to get there, were coached by guys like Roy Williams and, and Coach K, right? And it wasn't so much, and yes, they were great coaches, and they have been, and they're, you know, both of those guys are legends forever. But they also had great teams. So when you only have to win four games to get to the Final Four, it's easier when you have a horse, uh, a stable of horses who can run all day, right? So now what you have is, okay. And, and by the way, Hubert got there last year with a team that I thought was just okay. They didn't hit yeah. stride until, I don't even think they hit stride until the NCAA tournament, you know? They were, they were like floundering in February. So I don't think you're making too much of it because I, I think so much of March Madness is luck, the draw, the bounce of the ball. And in some cases, the ball hasn't bounced. You know, if Scotty Reynolds doesn't go coast to coast, then we don't say this about Jamie Dixon. You, you know, know what I mean? I, yeah. For So listen, so I had a friend in that game. LeVance Fields was my high school point guard, the best, right? So I'm watching yep. that game like locked in. Yeah. And I met Jamie at the Final Four, and it was kind of a vacation, so I'm not going to throw it on him. But yeah, if I ever talk to him, how did they press? How did do you think he that was it. designed, or that guy just got? How do you press like that, or not necessarily press, press? But how did that guy get turned around on Scotty Reynolds? You know what's funny about that? What you're saying? It's it's funny because you know how fans criticize officials. Yeah. Every game, every single game. Like I always say, this: if your team lost, the officials stink, and the announcers are worse. If your team lost yeah. on Twitter, right? hundred percent. And so sometimes we don't look back like, and like we kill the official, but we don't say this guy's a great coach, but he made a mistake pressing. You know what right. I mean? Like, and so that's an instance where I guess if you asked Jamie, gave him truth serum or a couple glasses of wine, he'd say, nah, that's a bad move. You know, we shouldn't have pressed him. So that happens and great coaches do it. And in retrospect, maybe he wouldn't have done it, but that's my point. If he could go back and change it and he doesn't press and maybe he keeps Scotty Reynolds from going, you know, coast to coast, much like when you watch the highlights of Danny Ainge, right? Notre Dame. A hundred percent. So, you know, we may, we coaches make mistakes too. And, but my point is that's where the luck comes in. One play changes the outcome of maybe a season or a coach's career. Yeah. No, that, and I mean, that happens throughout the whole, didn't Mike yeah. Miller's team win on a buzzer beater in the first round that got to the Butler. final in 2000. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's a million of them. And it always seems like it, it's like, uh, it's like the old adage, like you come up, you hit, your, your car hits a deer and you yeah. walk out. If you check to see it's okay, it's going to get you in the neck. You better yeah. like, you better kill it while you can. Yeah. Cause those teams seem to last all the way through. You know, yeah, I thought you were going to say, if your car hits a deer, you just want to lucky, lucky to be alive and walk away. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, but, and it's kind of the, the analogy for basketball is, you know, sometimes you're going 75 miles an hour and you, you hit a deer, you know what I mean? And what you think is a smooth ride to the final four, <laughs> You just totaled your car. <laughs> yeah, it's nuts. No, it is. It's nuts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So do you, to touch on that too, like some of these legends, they're yeah. all kind of going. I think Behan's on the back nine. Yeah. I think Izzo's on the back nine. Huggins is great. Hung out with him. Think he's kind of on the back nine. Is this turning? All, all the guys you mentioned can get to the final four. Like Nate Oates. Nate Oates doesn't have to get to a final four right now to be for us to be able to say, this is a guy that's on the way to being one of the great coaches in the country, right? Yeah. Matt Painter, you could talk about the bad luck. Hey, you know what? If um, Kia Clark makes the biggest play in Virginia history, right? He get he get he chases down the missed uh, free throw. I think throws it ahead, and the big kid scores. Otherwise, Matt Painter's in the Final Four, and so these guys are all ready to break through. Luck's involved, one play here or there, and so there's a lot of teams this year. You mentioned a lot of guys that I think could make that first appearance. Is it turning into a young man's game though, with this NIL and? you know, these relationships, because it's it doesn't seem like a coincidence to me that when this started to come in place, Krzyzewski's like, I'm out. You know, Roy's like, I'm out. Jay Wright, yeah. I'm out. So yeah. is it turning into a young man's game? 
Uh, yes and no. I think like I know I know pretty much for a fact because I have because my son Matt was at Villanova yeah. for five years. I think Coach Wright did one of those things that we all a lot of coaches should do and wish they could do. And I kind of did it in a small way at 43 where I said, I'm going to go to TV. I can raise my two boys and I have a good life. And will I miss the highs and lows of coaching? Yes. Jay, 60 years old, two national titles, Hall of Fame, three grown kids in Philly in the area, beach house on the Jersey Shore, going to get a TV contract from CBS. What else you want to do? No, I get that for sure. But it's, yeah. yeah. All of them, if it was just one guy, I'd be like, all right, that makes sense. Right into the sunset. When it's a few of them, you start to add it up. You know what I mean? Well, here's what I think. To answer your question, I think we're in a new normal. And the new normal is NIL. It's transfer portal. And if you don't embrace the new normal, then I think you're going to be left by the side of the road. So whoever it is, whether it's an Izzo and Tom's a close friend, you know, um, Bill Self, you know, look at Bill Self. He's taking transfers every year now. Think think about what Scott Drew and Mark Few particularly and some others did over the last 10, 15 years. They built their program not only around high school guys, but transfers. You know, Gonzaga wouldn't be Gonzaga without all the transfers. So that never, yeah, never would have been heard of. So if you got to give credit to a Mark Few, a uh, uh, Tony Bennett, he's taking guys like uh the kid that's uh, Trey, uh, Trey Murphy, who ended up a first round pick, transfer from Rice. You you got to embrace the new normal. Um, I I think having said that, there are some coaches who say and will tell recruits this. I can't. It's it's illegal for me to promise you nil money because it is actually right. And we know some coaches. You know, I think the guys that are most upset with nil is the guys that used to cheat. <laughs> because now they're they're if if you navigate yeah, nil. Yeah. Like their 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 advantage is now negated somewhat. Of course, you know what I mean. Yeah. And so, uh, and I'll get in trouble if I mention conferences because I'm in trouble with one already. I won't. But we know it's been going on for one thousand years. And the point is, if you're going to coach in the modern era, going into the next 15, 20 years, you got to embrace the transfer portal, which means you got to treat your own players well. Okay, you can't lie to them. You can't use them. You can't be transactional with them. You, you got to really dig deep and develop relationships with your own players, which is a good thing. And number two, if NIL is involved, you have to figure out how to navigate it. Even if you're not doing as much as say another school is like, you know, we all know Kentucky has resources. You know, we know Kentucky is Kentucky for a million years and coach Cal's done an amazing job there, notwithstanding here the recent bump in the road, you're not going to compete with Kentucky in a lot of, in a lot of ways on NIL. And then maybe you don't, but Matt Painter is not competing with them now for top recruits. And so each coach is going to have to understand his own NIL level of expertise, deal with it. And they're going to lose guys like they lost guys to cheating over the last 100 years, you know, since Dr. Naismith invented the game. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of levels to this game for sure. So, and you've seen it all, obviously. So that works again too to Kentucky, right? So the SEC big 12 challenge um, this weekend, the three that stand out to me, Kentucky, they play Vandy tonight, so I'm going to go out on a limb and say won four straight, um, right. especially if Stackhouse acts like a wacko. But they've won three <laughs> straight. They host Kansas, who they smacked yes. last year. And I actually, yeah. that's when I, I wrote something the other day. I'm like, Kansas fans, like, relax. You lost by two at yeah. Kansas State. You lost to Kentucky um, last year. It's very similar to yeah. the loss Saturday like to TCU. Like, relax. You, you'll be okay. Now I'm starting right. to worry a little bit more. But is Kentucky back, or is this just a three-game stretch? A good three not, game I, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not going to drink the Kool-Aid yet because yeah. um, the win at Tennessee was huge, but Tennessee has two or three games. I worked for coach Barnes. Okay. At Providence college years ago, big East back in the old days, Tennessee has two or three inexplicably bad games every year. You know, like they could be it's number that three. style. It's like Virginia. It's that style. I, I think so. And, and the, the Knights, they're not grinding you to death and they're not scoring. You can win. And Kentucky went in there and spanked them, you know, and that was a big win. And it was a, a test of Kentucky's fortitude a little bit. But you look at Kentucky even over the next stretch of games and yeah, they got to play Tennessee again at home. They got a lot of wins on their schedule left. And 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 so I don't even think I'm going to drink the Kool-Aid going into March if it looks like they've turned it around record wise. Having said that, they must have had a come to Jesus meeting here in the last couple of weeks, because if you really analyze their recruiting class and all these guys, they don't have a lot of, they don't really have Anthony Davis and 
John Wall on their roster. It sure seems like they get the number one class every year, and they're not really performing like they should be. I think they've done a worse job with transfers other than Oscar. Than the like, like first of all, here's what I Kellen, would say about Kellen Grady was a disappointment. Yeah, but he was a good, he was a good, not great player at Davidson. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like Kellen Grady's best years at Davidson were his freshman and sophomore year when he came out of nowhere from Boston, played at Northfield Mount Hermon, you know? And so that's what I'm saying. Sometimes we all and fans hype up these transfers. Severe Wheeler right now, they're better without him. They're playing better without him in the starting lineup. Now, maybe he's going to be a great sixth man. But the problem with Kentucky in the recruiting classes is not all number one classes are created equal. For every Anthony Davis, Michael Kidd, Grill, Gilchrist, John Wall type player, there's uh, Chris Livingston, who might be a nice NBA player someday. Cason Wallace, I know his family well. His brother plays for us on USA's three-on-three program. Keaton, great player at Texas San Antonio. I think he's going to be a good pro, but he's not John Wall. Right. You know, there's no Anthony Davis there. So I think sometimes because you're at Kentucky, you get hyped too much and it really hurts the kid from developing. And then when they get upset by a veteran team, um, people go, what's wrong with Kentucky? And I think sometimes right now, would you rather have a team of fifth, fourth and fifth year guys or a team of one and duns? And right now, if you don't have Anthony Davis, I'd rather have the veterans. Absolutely. Yeah. I also don't think he's that great of an in-game coach, you know, I you think know, that's a fair criticism. But. I, I would say this about John. I've known this guy. I'm going to tell you something. We're not close anymore. We don't talk a lot. I've known John since 1978. We were counselors at the at the Dean Smith basketball camp as college sophomores. He was a great X and O coach at UMass and Memphis. And um, I think right now when I watch them, there's a lot of freedom. The freedom's not always placed in the right spot. Uh, John's big thing is play hard and share the ball. And if you got NBA talent, we'll win. And when you don't have NBA talent and you're not out scheming guys, they're just average. Yeah. I don't, I say, I say this, um, and I'm going to, this will probably, you know, I don't, I don't think he's got a great staff. I don't think there's anybody there saying we shouldn't run this. We've been running this for 15 years and it doesn't work. There's nobody there to kind of hold him accountable and he won't change and he'll get back to winning. Trust me. He'll get back to winning and they're not going to get rid of him. I just don't see like when I watch them play. I don't know what their offensive philosophy is. I can't. Yeah. And I, and and I, listen, I'm I'm undefeated, Rico. I'm undefeated. Yeah. Like I haven't lost a game same in 20 same. years. Yeah, so same. I'm all no. I got you beat. At least you got yeah. some losses. I got I'm some losses. I got, yeah, but I, it's easy to be critical of John. But I know that John can be a great coach again. But some of it is that their their talent is not as good as we thought. And then I think he probably has to kind of tweak some stuff he's doing, especially offensively. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Um, Texas, Tennessee, right? So yep. I'm not a huge fan of Barnes teams. I like the guy and he's been around forever, but I just look at it as like, you know, you had Durant and you didn't get to a final four. You didn't, yeah. you didn't win the whole, like, I don't know. His teams seem to flame out, but I will say this. Are we kind of sleeping on them? They got four guys scoring in double digits, five guys in double digits. The yeah. next guy's like 9.1 or whatever it is. So, yeah. and that style can really grind you up in the tournament when you're playing in four-game spurts. The only thing I worry about, and I said it about Virginia all the time, was if you can hold a team to 52 points in 33 minutes or 34 minutes, like yeah. that's great. But everybody in the country is capable of going to get 10 in six minutes or 12 in six minutes. And if you only score 62, I could beat you 64-62. So I worry a little bit about that style. They match yeah, well, up with Texas. Yeah, no, they match up with Texas. I like Marcus Carr. Saw him in person. I think he dribbles a little too much. What's the key in this one, and who do you think is going to win? Well, Marcus is playing the best of his career. He does over dribble. He gives the ball a headache. You know, he does. Like, the, the ball is screaming for some excedrin sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I got to tell you, watching him last year and this year, completely different player, less pressure on him because Tyrese Hunter, who's not having a great year, at least he takes the pressure off of Marcus from having the ball in his hands. Like, you're not going to fly across the Atlantic if when you board the plane, there's only one pilot in the in the cockpit, okay? You're going, no, 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 I'm not getting on this plane because if this guy has a heart attack in, in midair, we got, we're, we're right. screwed. So it's always good to have two and three co-pilots. And by the way, I think Tennessee's strength is that they do have two or three guys that can play the point. But in, in Texas's case, what why they've been very solid this year, and I would say they've reached their potential 
And I don't know if they're a Final Four team, but they're certainly playing at the level based on their talent. Because if you break down Texas, who's their NBA player? They don't really have one other than Dylan Mitchell, who's going to be an NBA player, and but he's not going to reach his peak for five more years. Um, so the only NBA prospect, really, legit, is Dylan Mitchell. And he's averaging five points a game. Um, kind of like Peyton Watson last year, right? Yeah. And by the way, he's playing great in the G League. He's going to be a good NBA player. But getting back to Texas, um, they're, they're, they're reaching their potential. Marcus is playing great. This game Saturday, Tennessee should win. They're at home. There'll be 20,000 there. Um, the thing about Tennessee is, to your point, they're always going to be great defensively. Always. But to your point, in a one-and-done situation, the night they go three for 19 nope. from three, and you got a Butler. I, Butler's a bad example. I was thinking, you got me thinking about Butler and Mike Miller. But you get a Creighton, okay? You get a Creighton that comes in there who's played everybody, uh, played in Maui, and now they're getting their act together. And all of a sudden, it's a Creighton-Tennessee game. And, you know, those guys, you know, uh, uh, Kalkbrenner's scoring inside or the kid from South Dakota State, uh, Shireman, yep. is making threes. Ryan Nemhart's making threes. That's the kind of team that knocks Tennessee out of the tournament, a team that can – you know, score 16 points in the final 10 minutes of the game when they only had 48 and then they go 16, eight run down a stretch and they beat Tennessee. That's the kind of team that can beat them. Yeah. And those teams are few and far between, you know, I think Iowa gets up and runs it. Tennessee kind of put it on them. Yeah. But it's, you know, I mean, you got to have the talent to really get going with Tennessee. So we'll see. I mean, Alabama plays Tennessee, seen Tennessee soon. That's going to be an interesting matchup of style of play and who can control that. Yeah, uh, no doubt. Would you, who would you go with, with Texas? Would you roll with Rodney Terry? Or well, who would the first call be? You think he's well, going to get I, the benefit of the doubt? Uh, yeah, I think so. Here's the, here's the deal. The AD, who's a good AD, who, who was at Arizona as a senior associate, so he knows what a great basketball program looks like. And then he hired Jamie Dixon at TCU. Good for him. I think Jamie was always waiting for the right time to go home. I know that because I talked to him a lot through the years. Um, and I was doing a Big 12, and he'd always ask me, like, what do you think? What do you think? And I finally, it got to a point where – Pittsburgh, as you know, because you know LeVance. By the way, had I stayed at St. John's, honestly, these are all kids that went to Pitt. My my guy Slice, you know, I grew up with Slice. Yeah, Barry, yeah. Yeah, you know, Barry Rorson. And I've never said this very often publicly, but I'm going to tell you because you, you know the lay of the land. The worst thing that St. John's did when they fired me for interviewing at Arizona State, and I'm long since over it. I go to games there. I don't really care. I've had a great life. They didn't realize that not only were we getting Ron Artest and Reggie Jesse and Anthony Glover and Eric Barkley, but kids like LeVance Fields that were in seventh and eighth grade were coming to games. You know what I mean? Like I like Shigari Aline, the seven three kid, he was at St. John's game when he was in eighth grade. And so what happened was St. John's never realized that I was so connected in the city. The pipeline was going on like when I was going to Gauso Gym. And I would walk in in the middle of the summer, not to see a player, but just to say hi on my way home to Westchester. One of the coaches would say, coach, see that kid there? His name is Kemba. Remember him. And I'm not saying that happened because, you know, I'm not saying Kemba was in, but they used to tell me this kid's in seventh grade. He's going to be a monster. Yeah. Well, what was the old, I mean, ESPN last night had four guys going division one at Christ the King. The the two kids from Hayes are unbelievable. One's going to Carolina. Yeah. Um, Who's the other one I'm thinking of too, that was in that game. Oh, well, Boogie Bland, unbelievable. Like step and act, step. Yeah. What's and, the and old line? The old line is my recruiting budget was a was a subway tokens. Pretty much. You know, Louie did it. And and so uh, so when Jamie, if you think about it, when Jamie was at Pitt and they were getting all those New York kids for good reason, St. John's was down. Mike Jarvis didn't recruit him. And then my man Norm Roberts tried really hard and he did. He got them. Remember, they fired Norm before all those kids were seniors, right? Yep. And they Lav came in and won with Norm's kids, and he admitted that. But when Jamie saw that the ACC was not the fit for Pitt, could no longer get New York Jersey kids because the whole hook, as you know, was LeVance Fields gets to play Seton Hall and St. John's in the regular season, and then you play at the Garden in the Big of East. Of course, yeah. Pitt, Pitt had a Pitt had it Pitt had it going, and once Jamie saw the ACC, like nobody cared about Wake Forest playing Pitt. Perfect time to go to TCU. So I don't know how I got off on a tangent, but. No, I like that conversation. Well, I'll go with this too. Like, so is St. John's even a good job anymore? They're playing three games at the Garden and the facilities. Like if you're pitching yeah. a kid, like when Roll Atkins, it came down to him and yeah. Arizona. He's going to Jamaica, Queens, which, you know, it, it is what yeah. it is. 
And he's yeah. going out to Arizona with a pool party, a PlayStation in his locker, and like, you know, beautiful beach. Like St. John's, I, I kind of don't think is a good job anymore. Well, I would say this for a long time, they were able to get by on subway tokens. They yeah. really were. The, 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 you know, Chris Mullen, Walter Berry, you name it, Mark Jackson, you know, then later on, Felipe and Zenden, who I loved coaching those last two years. And then I obviously left them a team that went to the Elite Eight. And we were we were rolling, and and my, mainly because when I would recruit Elton Brand or Ron Artest, and I would say that, and they all played together, right? Riverside Church. Yep. Elton, when I go to visit his mom in Peekskill, she'd say, "Coach, we love you, but I want Elton to get out of New York, get away." Yep. And he's being recruited by Duke, and guess what? That's kind of a no-brainer, okay? Ron Artest, Queensbridge, the the family, the hangers-on, the therapist. He, he yeah yeah he was made for St. John's. Mark Jackson, Chris Mullen, you name them. And so when you recruited St. John's, especially now as the talent level is coming back, you got to you got to identify the kids that absolutely want to play in front of friends and family. And but nowadays, there's not that many of those guys because they go to prep school in many cases. I'm so glad the Catholic League is coming back. But a, an eight, a 14 year old goes to prep school in Brewster or New Hampton and they go, why do I want to go back to Queens when I can go to Chapel Hill? Yeah. Or, or Lexington. And that that's real. So is it a good job? No, it's not the job it was. I thought Mike, he could get this thing going, but I also know this, Rico, not every Catholic school has figured it out. Okay. Basketball at a Catholic school and you don't have major college football is the front porch of the house. It's not the most important part of the house, but it's the part people see first. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask you now what you think about when I say Gonzaga, Villanova, Creighton, Xavier, Dayton, more recently Providence. Yep. Okay. What do what do you think about? It's all those are all basketball schools. All right. Now, what do you think about when I say St. John's, Boston College, Seton Hall? Yep. You know yeah, what? A little bit of baseball for St. John's, Boston College football. Yeah, you're right. You know, you don't really get the vibe that they care about basketball. Now they do at St. John's, but. They just haven't been able to figure it out. I thought Mike would be the right guy. I think he stabilized St. John's, but now the question is, where do they go from here? And I don't know. The answer is yeah, the, I don't know. the other thing you talked about too, like Shigari and these guys being at games when they were eight years old. Yes. You know, same reason I'm a Knicks fan, same reason kind of the Knicks aren't that great. It's because I kids 18 years old have never seen St. John's be good ever. Right. So That's how do you right. sell them on the stuff? You know, the, like you and my dad's age going to games and the yeah. Ben Mullen and 85 and that's like, you got to look that up in a history book. You can't sell me on that. You know, my, my final year, I was only there two years. And then the, you know, the president decided I wasn't the right fit because I was disloyal and looked at, you know, uh, you know, Arizona state, Kevin white was the AD there. Dickie V Calipari, Sonny Vaccaro tell me to take the job. But my last game in Madison square garden with St. John's, as we were rebuilding the program was an overtime game against Syracuse in the big E semifinals. 19,000 electric, you know, Ronnie Artest is a freshman, Felipe and Zenden is seniors, LeVar Postel, Tariq Turner, you know, and that was it. Uh, minus a few moments here and there, that next team that I recruited, you know, no, nope, I'm not going to take, take a back seat to saying that that was my guys, but that next team went to the elite eight and it's been downhill from there. Yeah. But when the garden is electric, when St. John's is good, there are very few. I don't care if it's say uh, Allen Fieldhouse, which I've done a hundred games. Uh, Kentucky, when the Garden is electric, with St. John's in the building, nineteen five. I, I put that up against any place in college basketball. I just don't know if it's ever no, going to happen it's, again. It's unbelievable. So the third one we're looking at Arkansas Baylor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Baylor starts out zero three in the league. We talked about as a gauntlet. Did we unfairly kind of write Baylor off? No, no, because um, they're not as good as the Final Four team, a team that won a national title. That would be impossible. But I think the confluence of events happened. Like, let's take a look at them losing badly at Marquette. I don't know about you, but that loss, not losing to Marquette, but getting blown out by Marquette came out of nowhere. And then when I watched Marquette beat Notre Dame, I did their game, and I love Shaka. All of a sudden, I'm watching Marquette, and I legitimately think Marquette's a Final Four team. Really? Potential. Oh, yeah. I think Marquette, they're ranked 15th this week. They should be ranked 6th or 7th or 8th or 9th. Really? Now, absolutely. You go look at what they've done. They they lose a heartbreaker at Providence. They lose a heartbreaker at Xavier. They come back and, I think, beat Xavier at Providence last week. 
Um, they've beaten some teams like a dog here. Um, and he's got a great uh, – so anyway, Shaka, the, the loss to Marquette, would, in retrospect, not a big surprise. Then they lose a couple close ones in the Big 12. And guess what? You can't be a guy who's an expert and says the Big 12 is by far the best league in the country and they get mad at Baylor for losing a, a, a big lead to TCU, who then later on loses a big lead to Texas, who later on TCU goes and spanks Kansas. Right? So – Let's put that in perspective. The other thing that happened to Baylor is they had not a lot, but a couple different games like in December, January, no flagler and or no crier. They actually played one game without flagler and crier. Um, they beat Tarleton State. And so, and they don't have Jonathan Chamochachua, who's out for the year, who should be the defensive player in America. That would have been a hand, <clears throat> a given, hands down, national defensive player of the year, who obviously had the big injury. We'll be back next year. So what have they done? They have put it together because Scott Drew is Mr. Positivity. Rather than going in the tank, most Baylor teams usually do this because Scott is so positive. And they have great guards. I don't know about you, Rico. I don't know why they're not talking about him more, but Keontae George has been better than advertised. No, he's unbelievable, especially as a freshman, too. He's unbelievable. And here's what he does. He goes and gets 32 on the road when they should lose to West Virginia. He just, you know, UB Brown told me this years ago. He's my mentor. Um, he said, you'd be surprised in the NBA how many star players don't want to take the last shot. Really? They don't want, yeah, they don't want to be the guy that, you know, like, remember the Michael Jordan commercial? Yeah. I failed over Obviously. and over and over again so I could succeed. Like, does Michael Jordan miss like 59 last second shots? This kid, Keontae George, he wants to take the big shot. And you add Flagler and LJ Cryer, who's been who was out all last January, uh, February, and March, hurt during the preseason. They're starting to come into uh, into form. Jalen Bridges finally is playing great, nine and six in the Big Twelve. So yes, Baylor's back, and we did write him off too early. Yeah, and then Arkansas on the flip side. I like Musselman. Um, they've had some up and down seasons the last two years, but they resulted in elite eights. So, Correct. you know, and I know they're missing guys. What's the up, still some upside in Fayetteville or, you know, probably just the, looking at the sweet 16 as all right, you know, we had some rough breaks. We still yeah. got the tournament, got to the second weekend. It is what it is. I think it is what it is. I think it's going to be that kind of year. Yeah. And listen, at this time last year, like I must like to your point, they were like one in four in the sec and same type of thing. But I saw Nick Smith play against Texas in that charity game. Now Texas blew him out. Uh, but they started three freshmen and Nick Smith was the real deal. I'm telling you, he was the real deal. He's a top five pick. And I don't know if he's coming back or not. I tend to doubt it, but I don't have inside information. And then this kid, Brazil, that tore, tore his ACL. I mean, he was a major factor that people don't realize how important he was. The Mitchell twins from, from Rhode Island, nice players, but they were not tra uh, Brazil. They just weren't. So now you're relying all these freshmen. Uh, you're relying on Davis, who's a nice player. The, the twins, um, if they get to a sweet 16, I think it's going to be because Eric is a tremendous coach and he's used to putting things together, being a CBA G league guy. Yep. You know, he's used to having like a one team one week and then a new team two weeks later. So I wouldn't put it past them. They got a really big game on Saturday in Waco. I'll be there um, to do that game. And uh, I, you know, I kind of think Baylor's probably if I if I had a, if I was a betting man, right? And I don't do, do do that. No, I haven't seen the early line. I would say Baylor six and a half. I would think so too. But I mean, that's a statement win if Arkansas can somehow pull that off. Correct. You know, because the SEC is a gauntlet too, so they'll take their losses. Um, yeah, correct. So I think that's a big opportunity for Arkansas. I think they play LSU tonight at home. They should win. And I'm not going to put it past Muss. He's a good friend, and he knows how to kind of keep things afloat because that's his background as a G League guy. I think the other thing, too, that you look at, you know, if, if you have an OK season and some guy's draft stock doesn't hit where it's supposed to, those yeah. guys come back. And he's obviously been in the mix for recruiting with really good classes. Now put a really good class with a really good class. You might have a super team. You Let know, me ask you a question. I can't believe you just said that because I'm going to do Duke Miami in two weeks. Jay Willis can kind of pick and choose his game. So he's going to do Texas, Kansas. And I get to do Duke Miami. I watched Duke last night. Are any of those guys really ready for the NBA? I don't think so. You know, and like maybe a couple come out and they get drafted on potential, like a uh, Peyton Watson, you know, Filipowski might come out. I don't know. 
But if you look at that freshman class, the number one class in the country, Derek Whitehead's got Derek Whitehead, nice player. Newer kids got to learn how to handle the ball. Lively's got no offense. He's basically the reincarnation of Willie Cauley Stein right now. Filipowski is a nice player, but I don't know how much better he is than Matthew Hurt at the moment. And damn. He, you know, and, and yeah, I, I think no, you're better. right. When you put it in like that, like you're right. Yeah, I didn't think I, Filipowski was. I actually thought I saw them in person. I thought Iowa was going to beat them because yeah. Murray, Murray had an awful night. Um, they couldn't shoot, but I, I still think I, I don't think Duke is spectacular at all. I think now, it's a here's the cool boring thing. season for Duke. Yeah, here's the cool thing about Duke. When I watched them last night, if a lot of those guys and there's other freshmen I'm missing out on, but if those guys come back next year, like let's say a handful of them. And and uh, Blake's is back, and Roach is back, and they got another great class coming in. I know that. Now you see, but to win with freshmen with these guys again, not all number one class, not all number one recruiting classes are created equal. And in this class, there's no Zion, so you're going to get mad at Duke for playing all freshmen when there's no Zion, right? Or no RJ? Come on. Yeah, no. I mean, yeah. I what, what would yeah? I'm mean, not everybody's. You know, Brandon Brandon Miller is unbelievable. Like you, yeah. That's a guy who could carry you to a title. You know, so. and, and who knew? I, I was with Nate Oates and and uh, the staff this summer because they were in TBT that Buffalo team, and I remember um, Brian Hodgson, the assistant coach, great guy, good friends Brian, with him. Yeah, yeah. Brian Brian's a good man, and they got a great staff down there. Love those guys. And I remember saying to Brian because we were at TBT and that Buffalo team was monstrous. You know, they won the TBT. And he goes, we're going on a trip to uh, Europe after TBT. And we've been practicing. We got a freshman who's unbelievable. I'll never forget that. And when I watched them play Memphis, by the way, the most underrated player in America right now is Kendrick Davis from Memphis. I'm telling you, that kid is legitimately a first-team All-American. He dropped 30 against Alabama, and he didn't do it hoggishly. But when I saw Brandon Miller, I was there for two and a half days. He's Paul George. You know, Sonny Dykes said the exact same thing the other day. I've heard Durant on the comparisons. I think it's unfair to do that to the kids. But, man, yeah, Brian told me about him early, and yeah. I know Oates was high. Man, he, that kid is good. He's and legit. He's, and, by the yeah. way, and I'm going to take credit for Paul George because I said it early, but I also said that Noah Clowney's a first-round pick, the 18-year-old. And he's not the athlete that Brandon Miller is. And I, I they're, they're playing Oklahoma, by the way, in the, in the challenge. I love the Groves Groves. brothers. I really hope they can get to the tournament. Yeah, I'll tell you, Porter is a great coach. I'm not, I don't say great coach very often because I know, you know, to, uh, I, you know, I know great coaching. I wasn't one, I wasn't, but I know it. I know when I see it. And unfortunately, Porter just has a good team, not a great team. They got a good team, but uh, that'd be a bit, that'd be an opportunity for them. But uh, Noah Clowney's a, he's a young Horace Grant. Yeah. And he's 18, he's 6'10. And if he comes out, and I think they think he's coming out, he's not going to be ready, but he's a really good prospect. Let's put it that way. I mean, you just look at the depth of that team, too, right? So, like, Quinterly comes back early. And I asked, I was like, I, I was amazed how he even came back. Like, even asking yeah. doctors, like, they said he worked his ass off to get back. Yeah. So, and, and JQ is really, really good. They relied on him for a couple of years. Yeah. I don't want to say taking a back seat, but taking yeah. a little bit of of a backseat kind of to Mark yeah. Sears, who's yeah. unbelievable as well. So like the depth of that team, they were shutting people down defensively. And Mari Burnett is sitting on the bench. He's coming back right. off an injury. And then and what about Jaden Bradley, who's playing a lot now? Yeah, who's, who's like it? almost an F. When they came out, it was him and, and Miller. And it's like, all right, whoever explodes, explodes. Right. Miller's down, but he's still unbelievable. Like that team is. They, got, they, have, they are legitimately deep. And the thing about JQ, who I've known since sophomore year, I ran the Under Armour camps, uh, the All-American camps for three years. But JQ's like a punt returner, okay? He's going to run a few back, and he will fumble down on his five-yard line. And you can live with that. And he's a big time uh, – he's got big ones, okay? But he also – they don't need him to do all the things he did last year because Sears is better than anybody thought. And then Jaden Bradley's a different kind of point guard. But if they all stay – if the chemistry stays together – because of all the egos in the, in the locker room. And I don't think, I'm not saying that they, I'm just saying that every one of those kids should be a really good player. I, 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 they got nine guys. If they were on a different SEC team, they would be like one of the two best, three best Without players. Without a doubt. It, no, you're right. It does seem like a different attitude this year compared to last year, whatever I, it was. You know, I like, get the vibe. I get yep. that vibe, Rico. And anyway, they, yeah, they're they're legitimately a Final Four contender. Without a doubt. I mean. So, yeah, so that's the thing too. Like you look at, a lot of people are saying, oh, the year is down. Like we still have unbelievable games every night. Is yeah. there a super? Is there a super team 
or is there one or two that you're putting a little bit ahead of everybody else, like setting the pace? I think maybe it's Purdue and Alabama. I used to think Kansas was a super team. I don't yeah. consider Tennessee a super team. How big is the is the tiers? Everything on the internet is tiers now. Tier one, how many teams on that, if there is any? Yeah, I don't know if there is, although I think if you made me make – if you if there's only one team to me on tier one, and that's probably Alabama, just because – they got pros, you know, yes. like you hear the word, they got dudes, they got dudes and Purdue doesn't, they have Zach Eady, who I think right now today is a national player of the year. Okay. I, I think Trace Jackson Davis is having a phenomenal year. I saw them beat Illinois like a drum last week. I was there for Westwood one radio, but I think when you talk about future NBA stars, Brandon Miller has that vibe. And I think Noah Clowney's going to be there. And I think Jaden Bradley, if the jump shot comes along, He'll be in the NBA. He's a good player. Maybe a couple other guys too. But I think they're the one team that I'd say if you made me pick, but we also know that they could go out in the second round. And I well, think that's, that's just the tournament. That's the tournament. That's just the tournament. Yeah. And I think because there's so many veteran teams this year, because of COVID and the transfers, that I don't know that I could put one team. I don't think there's a super team. I don't. Alabama is the closest because they have NBA guys. Yeah, but that makes it for an unbelievable tournament. Of like course. That. Yeah. UCLA, you know, Arizona, you know, like the Big East. Even Crane, Crane's got seven, eight losses, whatever they're at. like, And they're on their way back. And I'm telling yeah. you, this Marquette team, the Providence, you know what Eddie's doing. If, if Providence got to an Elite Eight, it wouldn't surprise me. I told you about Marquette. You keep an eye on them. I saw Xavier play the worst game of their season. They lost at DePaul. I was there. And I thought Xavier, prior to that loss, was on the track to being like a sneaky Final Four team. And then I think in the Big 12, holy crap, you got six teams. If you told me TCU was in the final four, when I woke up like on March 30th, I would go, yeah, okay, so? Yeah, that's, exactly. That, that's Pitt reincarnated. That's Pitt without Scotty Reynolds going coast to coast. Yep. How about this one? I got Kansas at 15, I got Bama at 25, and I got Xavier at 55. Those are the three futures. I think they're all projected on the one, two, and three line right now. That's a yeah. pretty good portfolio. I never have good portfolios. I'm usually yeah. just explaining to you why we lost and like to reinvest. I got a pretty good portfolio right now. Uh, as good as you could have, I think. And you got, you know, you got like in a, in a Xavier's, for example, when they're and and I thought Sean brought some consistency and toughness that they didn't have last year because they had the same talent. They've had Suli Boom the transfer, but I thought I think on, until until Wednesday and they stunk the gym, gym out. Um, until Wednesday, I thought like, and and that's okay because every team has five games a year where they stink the gym out, and the key is you got to win some of those games or most of those games, and then there's five games a year where you make like eleven or fourteen from three, and you wish you could save it. You did it against Mississippi Valley State and you beat them like one hundred one fifty three. Yeah. So they had their bad game against DePaul, but I really like Xavier. Yeah, I mean he's been with three elite eights. I think he's lost twice in the first round as a higher seed, like he's not, he doesn't go out early. I like what Miller is doing there, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm glad he's getting a second chance. He's a, I've known him since he was a high school kid, paid his dues. He got taken through the mud with his reputation. That's probably never going to change, but at least he got a second shot and he got it at a place that needed him as much as he needed them. Yeah. You know? And yeah, I mean, it could, it could be worse. You look at some of the issues of guys getting dismissed, like what yeah. he did, you know, what he did, I'm not going to make excuses for, but like, no, no. It's a slap on the wrist now, you know. So that he made hey, he made he made mistakes, and he, you know what? He owned up to them because, after all, now when you think of Sean Miller, the first thing you think of is NCAA Literally. investigation. Yep. But I know from being around that team last year in the NIT, like they needed him. You know, they had I I heard they had an amazing crowd last week against Marquette and the Sintas Center. There's no place like it when it's filled. It's a good. It's a cool place. Xavier is one of those Catholic schools that I was telling you about. They need basketball to be good because that's what the identity of All the school in many ways. Yeah. Yeah. George, Georgetown's like that too, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't know what's going on over there. 30 yeah. straight. I think they win tonight. Let's put, we'll do this old takes exposed. I think they win tonight against the pole. I think they break okay. the streak. Well, uh, you know, Patrick's a good guy, but it's not going well. No, it's not. Uh, all right. I'll get, get you out of here on two quick ones. New Mexico, you coach there. They got yes. some dudes. I watched them last night, lost to Nevada. Yeah. Mashburn, yeah. House, uh, Yadule, I think is how you pronounce it. They're all yeah. averaging 15 plus. Patino's kid grew up in the in the crib with a basketball and a whiteboard, like knows yeah. what he's doing. But the Mountain West, five Ooh. of 17 in the tournament since 2013, 0 and 4 last year. One of them was favored as a as a six seed and one and eleven 
since 2016 in the first four and first round. Can New Mexico break that or they're just cursed? Like you look at the Big well, Ten, 20 years not winning a title. Is it just one of those now. things? No, no. Keep in mind now, Mountain West is really a high mid-major league. You know what I mean? Like they have some great teams, great venues, great coaches, but we don't say power six with the Mountain West, right? So when yeah, think- but they're overperforming. I think the A10, you know, um, yeah. the West Coast Conference for most years. I think in terms of bids, Mountain West is up there and, and getting high seeds, and they're not, they're just not doing it. Well, I would say that the credit to them is the high seeds and the reputation in in, in the league because I know from being in that league for three years, and uh you know, and, and believe me, you gotta remember now, I really wasn't a great fit there. I replaced Dave Bliss, we had a lot going on, it was crazy. But it's a great place to coach. And I love Richard Patino. He's become a good friend. His dad's a Hall of Famer, but Richard is a little different than dad. He's a little bit more self-deprecating. He can make fun of himself. He doesn't take himself seriously, which is why he fits, because he can take the fan base in Albuquerque, which is a phenomenal fan base, and you're not winning. It's like Kansas or anyplace else. And um, so I love what he's doing. That's an amazing turnaround in two years. They lost a heartbreaker last night. They got robbed on that foul call. Yes. Because the kid got fouled three times before he swung the elbow. And there's even a rule called the cylinder rule. Yep. Where you're vertical you're, space. You're, that's right. You got to give the offensive player. And that was a good crew. And they messed up because once they went to the monitor and didn't put a foul on either him or the defender, they couldn't go back and put a foul on the play. But they had to call him for a flagrant one because the end result was the elbow. And anyway, having said that, I love that team. I love San Diego State. I love, you know, uh, obviously after a blip, um, uh, Steve Steve Alford's got a good team. Boise's got a good team. Wyoming's been injured all year. Man, Wyoming is one of the biggest traps. They had the kid Jeffries, the shooter. He leaves. Um, EK, I don't know where he is. He's hurt. But see, those guys have been hurt. I know. Isaiah, yeah. Isaiah Stevens has been hurt. Maldonado was hurt. So, But it just goes to show you how good the league is that – the league flew past two teams that we thought were going to be at the top. And you got to give Wyoming a pass because EK, I don't even know if he's back yet. If he's back. No, he's not. I, last well, I checked, he's not. You can't. You can't win. And then all of a sudden, Air Force has gotten better. Uh, my man, because I live here in Colorado Springs, so I follow the uh, Joe Scott, the academy. They got seven sophomores. Um, Defend the three. Excellent. Yes, yes. And they're going to be good next year. They're good. They're okay right now. They're competitive. And then San Jose State, 10 miles. So anyway, your point is well taken. It's a really good league. They got a couple teams that can do some damage in the tournament, but I think the measure of the Mountain West is how many they get in and not how far they go. All right, two more. Pick right now to win it all. Oh man, you know I don't have my Ken Palm in front of me, so I'm gonna. You want me to really go out on a limb? You could just uh, set, I mean, you could you UCLA. Uh, Jimmy Jimmy Dykes pick Purdue. So like you uh, can. I like UCLA. I think really? when it's all said and done, yeah, because. Again, again, who knows, right? I wouldn't yeah. go to Vegas and sit in Vegas and you know hope for that. But I, I think UCLA is under the radar because they're on the West Coast. We don't see them at, at eleven o'clock at night, even though I'm in Colorado now. But I'm I'm on the road anyway. Um, and if you gave me a team to pick. I'd say UCLA because they have a terrific coach. They have Final Four experience. Um, they're built around defense. They have a fifty-year point guard. They have a potential National Player of the Year. He's probably like fourth, fifth, sixth on my list. And Jaime Jaquez, bonus coming on. They've got maybe the best defensive wing player in America in Jalen Clark. David Sing- Singleton makes shots. And Amari Bailey, until this injury here recently, has started to come around. So if you made me pick, that's a team I like because I think they can get through. Here's the deal. I think they can get through four games easily because they're not going to take a night off. They're not going to get beat by St. Peter's. Or did they get beat by St. Peter's last year? Or they? I don't think they did. It was, but they were close to getting beat. Did he get beat by St. Peter's? No, they Come lost on. to they lost to Carolina in a classic. I feel like. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. After Carolina beat uh, St. Peter's in the Sweet yeah. Sixteen, I was thinking that they were in the same region in uh, in Philly. Um, but anyway, that's a team I like because they have a lot of ingredients, including a coach who's not going to let up on them and you know take somebody lightly. Uh, and then I hate to say this. Yeah. But this kid Wembanyama, is yeah. he as can't miss as can't miss gets? I know you go, you do the overseas stuff for the draft. Yeah. Is he as can't? I thought, I like thought when I saw him, yeah, I thought when I first saw him that I, I'm old enough to remember Ralph Sampson being three-time National Player of the Year in an era where guys didn't come out one and done, 
Virginia, right? Ralph Sampson. Yeah, and, and Ralph was a 7'4", ball handling big, you know, and very similar. But the Victor, to me, has surpassed Ralph at the same stage. Um, they, there's only one question mark as to does he turn into one of the all-time greats? Um, and I think really? that's helped. You yeah, go, I think you so. go that far out on a limb. Like I, he reminds me, see, I think Kareem Abdul Jabbar, I'm old enough to know and think that Kareem is the greatest player of all time. That's me. Cause he, you know, he dominated basketball like in college. And in the first 10 years in the NBA, he literally could have averaged 35, 40 back when the league was like a wrestling match. When he went to the Lakers, it was different. He could average 35, 40 in his thirties, but he had, he had, he didn't have to because he had magic and worthy and Scott and everybody else. Uh, this kid reminds me of Kareem, but he might be even ahead of where Kareem was. No, yeah, I don't doubt. I mean, while just watching the highlights, I don't doubt you. Scary. It's you scary. Now, I think the one thing that sets him back is injuries. Yeah. Um, you see that with Holmgren, you know, and you see it with all the big guys, Sam Bowie, Samson, Holmgren, uh, Bill Walton. Um, you know, you go on and on through the years and big guys because of their body types, don't hold up well over time. So that's going to be the one thing that I'm concerned about. But I know his agent. His agent is a great French agent. He lives in Dallas. And they have nurtured this kid perfectly. He's only playing once a week in the French League. He's not in the Euro League. He's gone to see Dirk's shot doctor in the offseason. He loves the game. They manage his body. They've really done it well. If he stays healthy, he's like a 7'4 Kevin Durant in his prime. If I was the agent, I wouldn't even play him once a week. I would swear to God, I would be it, like. A, it, but that's the beauty of the fine line of like, he wants the kid to keep getting better and it's proven. Yeah. And you just, what do you do? I mean, like, I, like the crazy thing about this is if you love ball, what do you mean? I can't play. You're I heck- know. No, I know. You know what I mean? Like what, like these football guys, Nick Saban, right? His two guys played and they're going to be one and two. And all these other guys are like, like some of these guys are hermetically sealed right now for the NFL draft. Come on. You're a football <laughs> yeah. player. No, it's yeah, but it's Same thing with basketball. Yeah. It's Same crazy. Thing with basketball. So, coach, this was awesome. Obviously. Um, now I know Saturday you're in Waco, so I'll make sure I have the sound on that one. Um, Thank you. But yeah, definitely touch base, like probably right around, right around the tournament. Um, you know, and you uh, yeah, keep an eye out for the in game tweets. I usually tag you. <laughs> Okay. With, uh, with John Adams, who has now become a friend of mine. Hey, I um, love it. I love the idea that you're on top of the rules because not a lot of basketball junkies. Them. No, no, and that's why I got God bless Mike Pereira. We don't need. I don't need Mike Pereira. I don't. If I don't know a rule, and sometimes I get them wrong, I'm not an expert. So you know, I know the rules better now as an analyst than I did as a coach because didn't seem like it was that important back then. Believe it or not. But you got to know the rules if you're going to be on TV. So yeah. yeah, I'm good with the clock. Any any clock error in the country, I got people sending it to me. I'm good with the. I'm I love good it, with man. the clock. Uh, Take we'll it do easy. this again oh, soon. Definitely. Okay? All right, All right man. See you. Thank you.